Okay, we are recording. Jonas, how are you today? I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Um, I'm not too bad. That looks like a, a, a very beautiful studio you're sitting in there. Yeah, thank you. It's just my, uh, it's my, my home studio. So with that in mind, um, before we get on to your song choices, how have you found the last 14, 15 months as both a human being and an artist? I found it challenging, as I think most people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's been kind of grueling for, for me to, to, to watch all our uh, tours being canceled. Um, with Mew, I, I kind of, in 2019, I, I really needed to take a break from the band and, and focus on some other things. But then, of course, we were meant to go on a big tour in 2020, which was canceled. And then, you know, this year, in the beginning of the year, everyone thought, okay, now it's kind of, now it's back to normal and it still isn't. And just as, as late as yesterday, I had another show canceled. Uh, so, you know, I, I'll believe it when I'm on stage singing. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you, is it, did you feel like suddenly having that time where, uh, I guess a lot of musicians crave to have that time where they can not have to tour and, and look forward to some downtime where they can write and, and such. Was, when that presented itself, did you feel a weight of, of expectation on yourself to, to start writing? Or can, is that something you force, uh, or can you apply yourself like that, or does it have to kind of come from somewhere? I did feel like, okay, this is my chance to do some of the things that I've been, been kind of dreaming about, uh, finding the time to do uh, creatively. But I actually, uh, I did come off right off like uh, scoring a TV show in, in 19. So I was a little bit spent in the beginning. Uh, I, I was in Cuba actually when, uh, when this lockdown started happening and the travel bans and uh, we made it back home. But then uh, I actually, for like a few months, I kind of just procrastinated a lot. I kind of felt overwhelmed, I think, with the freedom to do other stuff. You know, it's like, sure. oh, where do I even begin, you know? So I actually binged watched a lot of TV shows and, uh, and uh, made a lot of nice food and just... <laughs> But, uh, but then later on, I, when I, st I started talking to my friend Toby, we, I actually rented a studio right next to his. And, um, and we'd been talking for years about doing a project together. And we just never found time. But then since both our schedules were kind of cleared all of a sudden, we, we've suddenly had the time to actually do it, which became the project Takis. So uh, we just put out our first song and uh, working on more stuff. So that's I exciting for and and so, what was you looking to get from from that collaboration? Like, was it a like a, a, a different kind of sound than, than any of the stuff you've done previously? Was it something that you talked about on and off for a long time, actually collaborating and working together? But how did that project kind of present itself? Well, I mean, we've worked together over the years. We actually we had a band together when we were like thirteen or fourteen. Oh, years really? Old. Um, yeah. And, uh, and also we, we kind of played, there was this band that kind of had members in it and then some some of the guys ended up being in Mew and uh, <clears throat> Toby ended up being in Blue Foundation. But uh, in the young, like when we were really young, we, we, we all played together. Um, so I, I don't know if we had any particular goal other than just making music together, you know, and, and, and we did have the rule that we, we didn't want to make something that sounded like Blue Foundation or like Mew, yeah, you know, and and I I don't know if we quite succeed. I think some of the stuff we have sounds a little bit like a mixture, as as it probably would, you know, as you would expect. But uh, I do think that we hit on some things that that neither of us have have uh, done before creatively. So that's that's been really exciting. Well, let's start the playlist and for track one. John, so I'm going to ask you, please, to tell me the song that you regard as having the greatest ever intro, please. Yeah, that was a that's a tough question. I uh, everyone I says to, that's the tough one. Yeah, I, I would have <laughs> to go. I would have to go with Princess. Uh, let's go crazy. That I mean, that intro is so magnificent that nothing could live up to it. And and I actually do feel a little bit of a letdown 
when it goes into the da, 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 da. I mean, it's it's great, but it's the intro. Just yeah. nothing, nothing can follow that and live. It's just so majestic and strange and, and musical and yeah. beautiful, you know, and exciting. It builds up to something, you know. And with that in mind, uh, a question that I, I like to ask uh, musicians and songwriters: that that track there is a prime example of something that if you took it to a record company now and said, right, this is going to be the lead single from this album. Right. They'd be like, no, no, there, yeah. there's no way you can have an intro that long. No. Um, and so with that, like, where, where I'm going with this question, and I've, I've desperately tried to ask this question correctly now for over 300 episodes. So I never quite get it out right. But from when you started writing songs way back and through and when you started writing with, with Mew, to writing now are you affected by the kind of the things that are put in place now for for kind of more popular music to right start with the chorus now and you know you need to grab them quickly attention spans are getting shorter with younger people and things like that are these things that are considerations or do you still write in a very traditional format of like the song's a song yeah i mean do you get where I mean, I'm going with that question? Yeah, Jonas? absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I, but I think actually it goes beyond that because I think that I am also influenced, and and I also actually uh, my attention span is getting short as well. Unfortunately, I, I wish it it didn't, but uh, there's a convenience to everything now. And I've been thinking about this also, like why do people not really listen to albums anymore? I think it's because there isn't like like when I was a kid. <laughs> Cause I'm kind of old now or whatever. I uh, I used to like walk around with my Walkman. I had like a whole album, and I was just walking, listening to music. And back then, I didn't have an iPad or with Netflix on it, or you know. And I think that a lot of this TV binging has taken over <clears throat> what what records used to be uh, in terms of of uh, stimulants and 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 you know things to occupy your your mind. Uh, I mean, with Mew, we, we've had to, to make single edits. I would say I would say that's the most we felt pressure to do something to the music. Uh, but other than that, we haven't let it influence us so much. But I think in, in recent years, I also start losing my patience too quickly with things, you know. And a friend of mine once said that, you know, nothing is interesting unless you're interested. And I think that's goes along with music is like you you kind of have to invest yourself in it a little bit if it unless it's just really kind of stupid straightforward uh, like if you want to have something that's worthwhile you have to you have to actually invest some some time yeah. and some energy into getting to know it you know and uh, i think that is really slipping away from the world you mentioned about people listening to albums you know uh, in their entirety uh, yeah. rather than going on iTunes and cherry picking tracks or creating playlists on Spotify. When you uh, put in a record together, do you still approach the track listing in a way that you wish the album to be listened to as a body of work? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think the, the, the order of songs is, is very important. We've, we've done one album in Mew where all the songs kind of uh, segue into each other. Uh, but but even with the ones that did, that don't do that, it's it's important. I think it's at least you know you, you might as well put the effort in, even if people are not going to listen to it like that. If, sure. If some people choose to, you might as well give them the perfect running order, right? Absolutely. So so we 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 try hard to do that. And I think that's you know when you said you'd walk around listening to you know your Walkman and things, it's like I, I was very much the same, and and I've got songs now that when I hear them and it finishes on the radio. I presume that I know what song's coming next because of sure. them years and years of listening to them in a certain sequence. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, I feel the same way. Okay, yeah. well, let's take you back uh, to the formative years. And I'm going to ask you for track two to tell me, please, the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you. Yes, I think that, you know... Uh, my first memories of music was obviously my, the, the music my parents were listening to. Uh, my dad listened to a lot of Beatles, uh, but I think Kate Bush is the first thing that I 
sort of clearly remember sitting in the back of my parents' car and listening on their uh, car system. Uh, and it was, you know, her um, compilation record, the whole story, where I think she actually re-recorded some of the vocals for some of the songs. But uh, I, that's all I knew of her was that album. And it had obviously cloud busting on it and, and running up that hill. And I, I just, I, they were like, I didn't necessarily understand what she was singing about, but but they felt like little, like uh, stories, you know, like yeah. uh, like otherworldly things. Fairy like, tales, like, yeah. Fairy tales, yeah. And uh, that really uh, connected. I think that was even not knowing what she looked like. She was my my first crush. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and I think that uh, it, it's really weird. I think like j just that initial thing with, with Kate Bush is just sonically, it just sounds like nothing else. Yeah, and I think, and then you start to kind of peel the layers of the onion, and you just get lost in just another universe of absolute magic. Right, and, she, and she's great because she's so experimental in her approach, and yet she never gives that like it's always just great melodies as well you know yeah. it's not it's not weird uh avant-garde uh which can be amazing as well but it, it it's it also is pop music you know yeah and it's just and it really and it's always like that it has your heart by by the strings you know so uh it's it's she's yeah she might be my favorite artist of all time did you um I don't know. I don't think she played outside of the UK. Did you get to the UK for them shows about six, seven years ago? The the it was sold out in ten seconds. Yeah, I tried so hard, but it was like a really annoying system where you had to choose the date, and I was like, any date, just yeah. give me a ticket. It's like, oh, choose the date. Oh no, it's taken out, back out, and then like, and then it's gone. No. Yeah. So uh, yeah, no, I failed unfortunately. Yeah. I had friends who went and said it was amazing. Yeah, I, I did. My friend, my friend went, and and they said they kind of. Um, I think they did they confiscate your phones on the way in and you got them back on the way out so that you couldn't capture right. any footage. And I thought, what a brilliant thing to do to have them moments where, no, this is a moment. Don't worry about filming it. Be there. Live it. You know, and it just yeah. pure, purely enjoy it. Right, wonderful. I had I had some friends who went and they said, like, in the intermission, we were just standing having a drink. And then Wendy Smith came over from Prefab Sprout and, and uh, we, we, you know, we said hi to her and she was really, and we, you know, talked for a while and then some of the, one of the other guys from Prefab Sprout and I was just like, oh, you know, <laughs> <right>. <laughs> because I'm a big Prefab Sprout fan. So yeah. That, that yeah. would have been just an extra, uh, you know. Has Paddy been quite influential on you then as a songwriter? I think, uh, yeah, in some, in some ways. I mean, I, I love Prefab Sprout. I actually, uh, I got to know it because somebody compared uh, our first ever record to Prefast Brown, which I don't really understand. I think maybe it's the, like the first ever album we did uh, had maybe some of the really ambitious uh, ideas mm. that might seem a bit naive, a little bit like, uh, you know, the very first Prefast Brown album, Spoon has, it has so many ideas, but it's also a little, lo-fi yeah you know like kind of and and but other than that i don't really uh, see the the you know comparison but then i was working at a place and my my boss there uh was a big free fast boss fan so yeah. we had all the albums and and i used to listen to them while i worked so uh, yeah and it's just a beautiful body of work that, that absolutely created. absolutely yeah. staying in the early years Jonas, I'm going to ask you, please, for track three to tell me a song that reminds you of your time at school, please. Yeah, my time at school. I mean, the, right around the time that we figured out that we wanted to be a band uh, was probably like the eighth grade. It was like 13, 14 years old. Uh, and at that point, I was really into the Pixies. Uh, I had a friend who was a bit older and... Nirvana had come out and he was like, yeah, that's cool, but, you know, check this out. And then he, he lent me, I think it was uh, Doolittle and Bossa Nova. And I just became obsessed with it and had to have everything that they made and uh, even all the, the, the B-sides. Uh, 
so yeah i was i was really uh, obsessed and, and and still a huge fan of the pixies so i would have to go with uh, pixies yeah excellent are you going to go wave of mutilation or valoria what what are you going for uh i'll go wave of mutilation wonderful yeah wonderful yeah. um uh, just as we're being nostalgic and, and looking back here i just want to ask you what your thoughts are on um nostalgic tours reason being you know over recent years i've been to see the pixies perform do little uh yeah and and lemonheads do shame about ray and all sorts of bands from them years of like of me being a, a teen and, and loving it and james yeah. and all these bands have come and toured that album um i just wonder like what your thoughts are on bands doing that I think it's cool. I mean, we did it ourselves actually in hmm. 18. We did uh, with the Fringers album. Uh, and uh, it is kind of, it's nice to, you know, to, for people, I think, to have the, the uh, opportunity to see, to sort of hear a whole album, a favorite album uh, live from start to finish. I think that's a cool idea, you know? Absolutely. There was a point when we started uh, talking about it when I was, I was a little against it because I said like, isn't this kind of what bands do at the end of their career? <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know, but, but it was just a misconception. It's become much more uh, popular to do it. You know, I wish I'd been able to see David Bowie uh, yeah. do his, his low uh, tour, you know. And I actually saw, I saw the Pixies as well. Do, we we yeah. actually supported them uh, in a show in America where they were doing that do little. How was so, that? That uh, was great. Yeah, it's beautiful. Oh, wonderful! He, uh, I was, I was took, like my brother lives runs a bar in Australia, and uh, and uh, in um, Brisbane, and the Pixies were playing that night, and he was just just behind the bar in his place, and and he said like I just looked up, and and Frank Black just walked into my bar, and he said, and I tried to be really cool and pretend that I didn't recognise him, and he and he come and asked for some food, and and he said he just started chatting, and he was just like so, uh, you know, so is this your bar? And he was like, yeah, and. <laughs> And, uh, and my brother said, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I'm, you know, I'm in a band. And he was like, I've got to let, I, I know, I love your band. And uh, and he said he was so cool. My brother said, look, I, I want to pay for your dinner. Like, don't, don't, you haven't got to pay. Like, can I just get a photo with you? Like, Pixies are one of my favourite bands. And he went, I can't let you pay for my dinner. He said, like, I'm going to pay for your dinner. And he said, and when he walked out, the girl that was, um, uh, the, 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 the bar person that was giving out the drinks, he just gave like a hundred dollar tip to as he walked out and i just thought what a top guy if you just didn't love the pixies enough just to know that that person at that moment was still wonderful like i love hearing little, yeah. little stories about people that you really love like the, you know Definitely. just seem like genuinely nice nice people you know yeah i i haven't like uh, people say don't meet your heroes but i i i still i haven't had a bad experience with, with yeah. any of that stuff yet uh, wonderful yeah do you ever do you get in awe of people? Do you get in awe of like when you meet people that have uh, you know? But the fact that we you know within your own right you've you know you've reached incredible levels of success in music. Like, do you do you and I use this term with respect? Do you get that imposter syndrome sometimes? Just thinking, oh my god, that's that band. Like, can I do I just go up and say hi because I'm in a band? Like, you know, well, how do you deal with that? And do you get like nervous and 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 that kind of well, I, I think I'm kind of shy as a person, uh, so I do, I've had, you know, many times when I kind of wanted to go up and say something and, and didn't, you know. And oh, even, really? And even with people that I'd met before and, and went to dinner with and like, should I go, ah, you probably don't remember me or whatever, you know, like that kind of thing. I'm a little bit, uh, you know, withdrawn. Um, yeah. But yeah, I do, I do uh, become in awe of people. I, I have to say it's not, it's not so much oh, this person is really famous. It's just like what this person has meant to me, especially, I guess, in a nostalgic way, that my, my sort of my teenage heroes, mm. meeting those people, you know? Absolutely. Uh, I think as you get older, maybe you don't idolize people as much anymore. Um, definitely. So, so it is something that kind of comes from the past, you know? Yeah, definitely. We'll stand in the past. I want, to, I want to talk about school briefly before we move on. And was school something that you enjoyed? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I enjoyed elementary school. I didn't really enjoy high school as much. Uh,
um, it was a weird, uh, I, I didn't really feel like I fit in like that, but I just kind of, uh, I didn't really know how to, uh, can you hear me? I think yeah. saying my, my internet connection is bad. Yeah, it, it, it paused briefly, well, but we're good. I think, I mean, we, we played in Mew already in high school and, and you know, we're trying to uh, get to play places, but our music was really not uh, the sort of uh, the popular stuff at that point, you know, so I don't know. I, I, uh, I guess for a variety of reasons, I, I didn't enjoy that so much, but, uh, but of course the, the, the friendships that emerged from it and, uh, and all that have been very valuable to me. You said that, you know, Mew was already um, playing shows and stuff. Was that something that you knew you wanted to do or was there something else that you, you were thinking about doing as a career or was music always at the forefront? I think that we started the band because we were a bunch of friends and uh, we were all kind of creative and, and it didn't really start as a band. I, I always kind of have been really uh, into you know, animation and music and, and drawing and stuff like that. And most of my friendships back then were kind of based around that, you know, like let's make a weird little film together or something. So that was just part of it. And and then, you know, Nirvana came out and, and I was really into the Pixies and I thought maybe, maybe, you know, I could be in a band, but it wasn't like, I don't think if I hadn't had those friends at that particular time, it, I, I don't think I probably would have formed a band. I, it's yeah. never been like a, a, a an ambition to, I want to be on stage, everyone mm -hmm. looking at me. You know, that That's kind of a, a tricky thing for me. You know, mm -hmm. it, for me, it's more about creating the music and and, uh, and uh, expressing something, you know. It's Do you still find it difficult, like like being on stage? You, is that kind of sort of a side of confidence that, that is always like something you have to kind of, you know, work with? I always get quite nervous before a show. And the few times that I haven't been nervous, I, it, it hasn't been a good show. So I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's also part of the reward. Like when you, yeah. you, you go there and you really do your best and then ah, it went well, it's like, oh my God, you know, whereas if it's, if it's just like, oh, I'm just going to work now, yeah. you know, then, then you won't feel as ecstatic from it, I don't think. Uh, I'm really impressed. Like I've, you know, I, I see friends sometimes backstage, and they're like sitting, talking about like, oh, should we, uh, should we go to your place on Saturday to watch the game? Okay, cool. I'm, I'm just gonna go and play for fifty thousand people. But it was so finished, you know. And I, I'm like, I'm not like that, you know. Even like, Johan, my my bass player, he can he can talk about football like five seconds before we go on stage, and I'm like, what, what? you know, like my mind is only here, like you know, so. Yeah, but people are different in that respect. I, I do enjoy, but I'm, I'm kind of a perfectionist. So that's part of my nervousness is that yeah. I'm scared that it's not going to be perfect. And of course, it never is perfect. So, yeah. you know, so there's that. But uh, I, I try to get around that. Well, confidence aside, if, if the, the fact that, you know, from a young age, you chose an incredibly competitive and difficult industry to achieve the level of success that, that, that you have. Yeah and continue to, 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 to move forward with, would you say you're very driven? Definitely. Yeah, I, I am. And I don't really know the reason, but uh, I do, I do really feel a need to, to, to engage in creative things, um, to, to just have, to just feel happy you now. Yeah. If, uh, and I don't know why I, maybe it's, it's, uh, escapism you know I hope it's not all that I hope there's more to it than that but uh because I, I quite like the world uh, I don't know why I have I mean that horrible things going on in the world but uh I don't know why I have the need to sort of create my own yeah fairy tale you know but, uh, but I can't do Right, this is the last song uh, from the formative years, and I'm going to ask you um, to tell me the first record you remember buying from a record store, please, Jonas. Yeah, well, it was either... Um, there was an album, it was a Dutch group called... I think it was Video Kids, and they had a, a song called Woodpeckers from Space. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, 
you know, everyone was really into break dancing. It's like, I think you bought that record, you got a pair of white gloves for, for you know, for break, break <laughs> That's dancing. That's so cool. But, uh, but I think that came with the record. I'd never really learned how to break dance, unfortunately, but uh, I was really into that song. I, I still have it, actually. Uh, it's a seven inch maxi single. <laughs> nice. And it's really annoying, it's just high pitched. Uh, Although a lot of current music sounds a bit like that, actually. But, um, I, I'd never heard it. And I, I listened to it when, when I got your list over. Right. Um, and it it's, sounds very much of its time. And it's a kind of production sound that you can kind of hear. Yeah. Again now. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. With the sampled voices and the sped up things. and Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, was, I'll take I, it that's I, Woody I, Woodpecker, right? Uh, I don't think it is. Yeah, maybe it is. Yeah, yeah, of course it probably is. Yeah, but is it, he's not on the cover, so they probably weren't allowed to use him. Yeah, but it, it's either that or it's. Uh, and I, I didn't, you know, I didn't buy them myself. My parents kind of let me buy something, and, and uh, I also got uh, the Cure uh, or Cure, and there are the Seven Inch uh, Love Cats single, which I love. At that age, did did you t like? like that record in any other level than it being quite a upbeat pop song with plinky plonky piano sounds on it. You know, was you aware of the, the depths that you can fall into if you start discovering The Cure and where that can take you? No, and I, 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 that was the only song that I knew of theirs for, yeah. for many years after that. <clears throat> I don't know why I, I might have even just bought it because it had some cats on the cover <laughs> or something, you know, I don't, I don't think I knew the song before buying it. And I actually, I, I remember that I was playing it on 33 RPMs, even though it was a seven inch. So it was yeah. like slowed down. And I thought it was just so mysterious and cool. And then I was kind of disappointed when uh, I found out that it had to be run faster. But well, it didn't uh, matter because about 10 years later, like, like, disintegration, and that was kind of played at that speed. And that was about yeah. as oh heavy and as weird as it could get. An amazing <laughs> album as well. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, but, yeah, but I didn't actually get, I mean, at that point, I think I was, you know, I think I had a Paula Abdul album, you know, it was just like, I was a kid, you know, it's just yeah. trying things out. And I think that's also one thing that gets uh, more difficult with age is you sort of, you form your sense of aesthetics and, and it's hard to change them after a while, or it's hard to, to keep them open, you know, but I remember, when uh, me and, and the, the other guys in the band, when we started like going to record shops and getting, we, we would buy all kinds of stuff. We'd buy like death metal and then we weird Japanese uh, jazz thing. And like, I, I don't know, I just, uh, that was cool. You know, I always thought, you know, I, I, we should listen to things that, that most people don't listen to because then maybe we'll be inspired to make something unusual, you know, yeah. rather than then make something, it's kind of a naive thought, but I, I didn't yeah. think, you know, like that. So, so did record company, uh, record shops become like important places for you growing up? Yeah, absolutely. There were two sort of main places we went to in Copenhagen. And uh, one of them is still there. It actually turned into a little bit of a sex shop as well, like a bondage kind of thing. Well, they used records. To, That's a good yeah, they used, but, but, yeah, and it's mostly metal. And I mean, it was also mostly metal they sold back then. But, but yeah. they also had, uh, I remember buying a whole album there, and Sonic Youth and stuff like that. Uh, but the other place has closed down many years ago. And, you know, there's still some vinyl stores, but, but it's very, uh, very few that are left. Yeah. For track six... Uh, for track yeah. five, sorry, I'm going to ask you um, for a song that soundtrack your years clubbing. And I always have to have like a, an addendum to this because I, I feel like I should always put it when I send the questions that what I've realised over the 300 plus episodes with most people that are in bands or actors or DJs uh, is that they're not big clubbers. And, right. Uh, and so this question can also be going to your local indie night i don't this this question doesn't have to be that time that you had your shirt off with glow sticks raving to like techno at like 4 a.m it can be any kind of experience or like 
you know, songs from like dive bars and things like that, 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 that right. just stick in your mind from them kind of years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I did go to bars and, and to clubs, but, but I didn't, you know, uh, I didn't go to raves and, and I always, like, I remember in school when, when the kids started sort of like having parties and, and you'd be like dancing. I always thought it was so awkward and, and I just looked at it and like, it doesn't look good. You know, like nobody looks good doing this. Like, so why, why are we doing it? And uh, so I think, you know, there was one girl in my class who kind of, she, she knew a lot of cool music. So she kind of had her finger on the pulse. And uh, I, I, I would say uh, she, because she, Played a lot of and then I don't even know how to say her name, but Nini Cherry, Nene Cherry, Nina Cherry, Nina, Nene, Nina, Nina. Okay, Nina Cherry. Yeah, uh, I think she made some great songs like Man Child and uh, and the Buffalo Stance. Yeah, it's like we always hang in a Buffalo Stance. What is that about? Like what? That's is, about. Is that, um, you know? Do you know? No, I don't. So there was a fashion movement, uh, and I think it was called like, um, oh, but was it called the Buffalo? It, it was like a, a movement, uh, and it was like a very kind. It was like a fashion movement, but and it was like it was just a complete look, and it was oh, was it like Buffalo Girls and Buffalo Boys? And there was there was a famous model called Jamie Jane Morgan that was that then had a music career off the back of that, and he was one of them, and it was this moment. And and I guess it was lots of like the, the way that they carried themselves. I hope I'm getting this right. I'm pretty sure it's not far off the truth. But I think we always hang in a buffalo stance was in tribute to, to that fashion movement and the stylistic the stylistic kind of look of, uh, right, of that, okay. that, that fashion movement. I believe that that's it. But to be honest, interesting. Na- Nana Cherry could could do anything and look exceptionally cool because she's uh, she's an incredible artist. Yeah, someone said that uh, because she put out a new record, I think, like a few years ago, and mm-hmm. uh, I haven't heard it, but a friend of mine said it's actually really, really good. So I really have to, is. I have to really check is. that out. She kind of made like made a lot of music that that kind of uh, after the like she become huge in the UK with with um, the the album was called Raw Like Sushi, the first record. Yeah, um, and that was huge in the UK, and then she had a, a big hit with um, Yusin Adore, uh, Seven yeah. Seconds. That was Seven quite. Seven Seconds. Yeah. I remember that one. And uh, but she she released a song with Michael Stipe called Trap, and it's so good. And it's like, but it just seemed to just get passed by. And and I think people yeah, are now, yeah. it's been long enough that I think people are now realizing just how important she was for that genre of like UK hip hop at that time. That you know people are now recognizing Nana Cherry for for what she's done. And uh, and yeah, the new record's incredible. And she she cool. kind of was very much involved in. Um, the Wild Bunch, which uh, which I don't know if you know, there was was members of um, uh, Massive Attack uh, and and stuff like that. She come, she was like part of that kind of Bristol scene. And oh. if you watch, I've got a, quite a few facts about Nina Cherry. It would appear, yeah. But um, I watched the recent. I don't know if you've seen the recent documentary about the Slits, and oh. uh, it's incredible. Uh, I think Nina Cherry was like joined the Slits on tour when she was like 13 and went on tour with the Slits playing all over the world because they were wow. big fans of her. Was it her dad that was Don Cherry, the jazz musician? I believe so. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, I don't know why I've just bombarded you with a load of stats about Nana Cherry, but yeah, she's- uh, no, I'm, I'm she's, happy to learn. She's, <laughs> she's marvelous. <laughs> yeah, um, she is, yeah. And Buffalo Stance is, is an incredible pop record. It, it, it really is. And before we move on, just, because oh, we're going to going to take you back home for track six, and I want to know about your home county. But you mentioned earlier, like being in the car and listening to Kate Bush uh, and the Beatles. What other music was you sort of exposed to? Was it was there always music on at home? Yeah, pretty much. Um, <clears throat> a lot of Eurythmics my parents listen to, which I I, I still really love Eurythmics. Um, Chris Jones. Um, yeah, and and uh, also Rolling Stones, but I, I I was much more into Beatles than Rolling Stones. Yeah, um, which I guess you have to pick pick one. <laughs> Absolutely, I'm with but, you uh, on that one, Jonas. Yeah. So, 
yeah, heading home for track six, uh, I'm going to ask you for a, uh, your favourite song from an artist from your home county, please. Right. Well, there is this singer <clears throat> called uh, C.B. Janssen, and he only sings in Danish. Uh, and he's been kind of going for, he still releases records, uh, you know, fairly, not, not often, but like every few years. Um, but he has a song, I don't know, I think it's from the 70s, it's called Elizabeth. And uh, it's about, basically it's about coming home to uh, an area where an ex-girlfriend used to live and, and seeing it and, and seeing how everything's, it's like the, the, the moment in time that is, ceases to be, you know, and, and yeah. there's a real nostalgia to it. And so beautiful uh, Danish lyrics. Um, yeah, I, he would be like, you know, the kind of thing that I would put on if I want to cry a little bit. <laughs> so so yeah. I'll, I'll ask you around that then. So if you, if you have a day yeah. where you wake up and you're feeling low, do you listen to something super pop and up? or do you reach for disintegration and process that emotion and, you know, immerse yourself in it for a bit? I, I do, uh, you know, I, I have a little bit of a melancholy uh, demeanor. Uh, and I was thinking in recent times that maybe, maybe I, I, I have listened to too much sad music <laughs> because I, that's, that's, I, I just love sad music so much, you know, it, it, it really makes me feel something and, and it's relatable and it makes you feel less alone with all the bad thoughts and stuff. Uh, but I, I went uh, a few years ago to see the B-52s oh. with my friend and it was great, you know, it was wonderful. And I, 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 I didn't really listen much to <clears throat> p52s but i am sort of thinking now that you know if if i if i have a bit of a bad day maybe i should listen to some happy music instead yeah. of uh, instead of like delving into it yeah. at this point in my life anyway i mean one of the most underrated vocalists ever is kate pearson from the b52s i think her yeah. voice is magnificent yeah definitely Okay, last track. This is she did, get... a, she did a song with REM, right? She's done, she done, yeah, done a couple. She's done the Shiny yeah. Happy People, and I think she done, is it Texicana? Another track on Out of Time, and oh, it's beautiful. Because they're, they're both from Athens, aren't they? In Georgia, yeah, I believe. Yeah, like... And she did a, she did a, a song with Junior Senior, a Danish band. Oh, really? Actually, no, she sang on one of their songs. I'm quite sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she did, yeah. Oh, wow. Mm. I've never heard that. I, I, I literally, uh, what, what was the global hit, the Junior's, uh, junior Senior? All Your Feet. Oh, what a pop record that is. Yeah, definitely. Oh, God. Um, okay, last track. So you can play DJ now, uh, Jonas, and it's a song that many may not know that you would like them to hear, please. Yeah. Uh, a few uh, years ago, I, I, I don't, I think it was, I was listening to, you know, the band Efterklang, Danish uh, mm -hmm. band. Um, they had a, they have a radio station called The Lake. I think you can listen to it online, thelake.com. And a lot of weird stuff on there. But uh, one time, uh, I just like to listen to it when I'm working on visuals and stuff. And, and this song came on by, uh, by Lucimila Carpio. She's from Bolivia and uh, she uses traditional Bolivian uh, folk instruments. Uh, she has a, magnificent voice you can do really high flute voice and uh, i just never heard rhythms like that before it's such a bizarre like when they start the guitar the string things it's like where's the one what how, how is that a, a, yeah. a, a, a meter and then he she starts singing and it all makes sense but for a while you're just like is that just erratic yeah. you know uh and uh, the, and there's one album in particular it's called the jujuan tapes i think it's called I I, I, love, I love that whole record. I, I was like, it's like falling in love listening to it. And it's a quite, it's a little, it's a little demanding for some to listen to. I would say, but uh, but it's quite good. And this song that I would choose is uh, called Jiwase. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. But, uh, Wonderful. Well, Jonas, we put together a, a Spotify playlist to accompany the podcast with all the songs that we've spoken about today, um, and, and we'll put the new track on as well. Um, Should we put some Nina Cherry on there? Well? Let's do that. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> yes. That's never a problem. Um, and so as we find ourselves, hopefully, you know, on, on, a, on a road out of the, the, the 
bizarre, you know, year and a half that we've been uh, working our way through. Um, what are you looking forward to as the world, you know, starts to readjust again personally and what's happening professionally? Uh, well, me and, and, and Toby are doing more tacky stuff. Um, I look forward to that and, and playing some shows eventually. Right now, we have a new show scheduled for the 6th of August. It's a festival in uh, Finland. So I'm, I'm hoping that's going to happen. Uh, and also shown in London, September, and, and uh, Copenhagen, and some, some other stuff. So hopefully, they will happen. And, and uh, hopefully more will happen. And uh, on a personal level, I, I do look forward to being able to travel some more again. Yeah. And uh, it's, I kind of been stuck in one place for a bit too long now, I feel. Yeah, I think so we're all feeling a bit like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Jonas, it's been delightful talking records with you. I really appreciate yeah, your time cool. today. And uh, and sorry if I uh, overloaded you with Nana Cherry facts. Uh, you got a little bit excited I, about that. I feel, in, I feel enriched. <laughs> I, I'm going to go and listen to the junior, senior Kate Pearson tracks. I've not heard it. I need to hear this. Um, yeah. Have, have, a, have a lovely day. Um, all the best for the music and look forward to uh, seeing you at the London show. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll, I'll see you. Come back and have a drink after. Sounds wonderful. Thanks loads, Jonas. Yeah. Thank you.